Love Talk Radio. Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We are talking about the book called The Might of Thoughts by Edward Albert Meyer, uh, Macht der Gedanken in the German, a, a book that teaches us how, how to control our thinking, to uh, live a happier life, and to live a a more successful life, because lower thoughts lead to lower feelings, lead to lower habits, which lead to lower circumstances in your life. And conversely, if you can have higher thoughts, higher feelings, higher habits, then you'll have better circumstances in your life. You are the Lord and Master of your life. You're in control of your life. What a human being can conceive of, he can achieve. So it's very important that we learn to control our thoughts, learn to focus our thoughts, and recognize when our thoughts have gone astray. And, you know, our consciousness is very much like a garden. And uh, if your garden's growing well, it's probably being watered. And what you need to do is nurture your consciousness. You need to nurture, you need to strengthen, you need to feed those positive, neutral positive thoughts, which will eventually lead you to success success and happiness in your life. It's very interesting to end up with a book like this. You know, when you study the Meyer material, I mean, if you've never listened to this show before, if you're listening to the archive or or whatever, uh, and you've never heard this show before, really this, this show, this blog talk show, is mostly about, at least it's kind of turned into that, it, the writings of this Swiss farmer. There's a, I call him a farmer. He's an author as well. He's a very prolific author. His name is Edward Albert Meyer. The world knows him as Billy Meyer. He lives in a tiny mountain village in Switzerland that's called Hinterschmidruti, which is about 52 minutes east of Zurich by car. He grew up in another area of Switzerland named Bulak. What's Corso? bizarre and hard for people to relate to and understand about the Meyer case is that, well, he he says he's had extraterrestrial contact since the age of about five years old and that he was prepared by these extraterrestrial humans to give information to the people of the Earth and that he's done this in, in former lifetimes before and now he's written 39 books that have all this this wealth of knowledge. Uh, the book that I've been focusing on lately is called The Might of Thoughts. I've I've got like a page or two to to have read it twice, and each time I go through it, I'm pulling back layers of an onion, and uh, the information is is quite astounding, and it's and it's much different than some of the things that I've talked about before. Uh, whenever doubts start to appear in your mind, you, they must be regarded and treated as obstacles. Obstacles on the way towards your development, towards your higher development. A, a doubt is a, a status where you're b- between belief and disbelief. You have uncertainty. Um, the Meyer information says doubt is an obstacle, and an obstacle is a thing that blocks or prevents your, hinders your progress. Everything that the human being ever conceives and allows to become ideas, allows to be then formed into imaginations and wishes and other efforts, all of these 
will ultimately bear fruit. Now, there's a word used in the Meyer information called zeal. Zeal means to set a goal or have a culmination point. So we also need to have goals or a focus for our thoughts. Now, in order to make your thoughts become reality, we also have to have wishes. We have a thought and then we have a wish. We tend to we nurture, we care for a thought, and you can form what's called a consciousness picture, an idea in your mind of what you want to achieve. Then you should start to feel some enthusiasm, and that enthusiasm can lead to reality. Of course, effort. You have to put some effort into things as well. The purely... One of the the concepts that the Meyer information talks about is love. And the Meyer information claims that our religions are wrong and that there isn't a that there is a universal consciousness, but it's not the God that's been depicted by our religions. The God that has been depicted by our religions is very human, very anthropomorphic, and that's because in many cases, there were gods on the earth in the ancient past. What I mean by gods are very highly evolved human beings who came from other worlds and were very advanced technically and sometimes not so advanced spiritually. So they presented themselves as the creators of the universe. And whether the god was... Jehovah is depicted in the Bible or Krishna is depicted in Eastern religions. It doesn't so much matter that much. But the Meyer information says that there is a universal consciousness. There is a a super intelligence which created our universe, but it's it's not human. It and it doesn't look over you in that sense and it doesn't get involved in human wars. Although the gods certainly have in the past gotten in view, involved in human wars. This universal consciousness radiates love. And that's the point I was trying to get to. And the incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of that love. And this love that is radiated by nature, it's radiated by the universal consciousness, is very therapeutic and very helpful for your psyche as a human being, your material consciousness. It's also healthy for your body. We have a psyche, and we have what's called um, a gamut. We have a material consciousness, and the psyche controls the thoughts and the feelings associated with the material consciousness. The gamut controls the thoughts and the feelings of the spiritual consciousness. Now, we reincarnate and we die. When we die, our material consciousness goes into the spirit realm in an area called the overall consciousness block. And the overall consciousness block processes what happened in your previous existence, your previous material existence. And it takes all those experiences that you had, um, and it turns those into evolutive forms. Evolutive forms would be something like love, uh, peace, tranquility. In the storage bank in this in the other world, and is the overall consciousness block. It's it's a storage bank that's created by your spirit form. And it's the place where your past life experiences are processed. You see, we have a spirit form. The spirit form is located in the midbrain in a realm called the superior colliculus. Now, That spirit form comes into the body of a child 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg, and it really animates the whole body. When the spirit form leaves the body at death, it goes into the spiritual realm, which is 
kind of like a etheric energy band that exists around our planet. Also comes your consciousness block, which is your your personality, your thoughts, your feelings. This consciousness block goes into the overall consciousness block where a process takes place. And the overall consciousness block goes through and it processes all the experiences you had in your last material lifetime and it turns them into neutral positive values, evolutive values, love, peace, tranquility, harmony. And those are stored in your spirit form. And then at the appropriate time, the spirit form is put into the superior colliculus again of a child Usually we spend about a lifetime and a half in the other realm. Uh, so if, you're, if your previous life was 75 years, you might spend 150 in the spiritual realm. The Meyer information explains that in times of overpopulation like we have now, spirit forms tend to spend less and less time in the spirit realm. So that probably has a bad effect as well. Uh, but this is the process that goes on. We spend time in the material and time in the spiritual. And this is how the spirit form gathers wisdom from lifetime to lifetime. Wisdom is a kind of knowledge that produces energy. And when we produce the energy of wisdom, we help the whole creation to evolve. And that's the purpose of our life, is to evolve the spiritual consciousness. The material consciousness is required in order to evolve the spiritual consciousness. Your material consciousness is made up of your conscious mind, your subconscious mind, your personality, your unconscious mind. When the spirit form goes into the body of a child at 21 days, the past life memories go into the subconscious the wisdom of the predecessor personalities goes into the subconscious. So you're getting impulsed. You're getting inspiration from those previous personalities, the wisdom of those previous personalities. There's also something called the storage banks. And the storage banks also give impulses to your spirit form, to your material consciousness as well. Now, Billy sensed these impulses for the first time when he was a young boy growing up in Bulak, Switzerland. And there's this wonderful writing that Billy did. It's called How It All Began. And as a young boy at 3 a.m. one morning, at a mild night in May, and it was 1941, he went outside, he crawled out a lower window in his bedroom, he went outside, sat on a bench, and looked up at a beautiful starry night. And one of the things he noticed was that the stars shone a light in the visible spectrum. But there was something else, another kind of light that he sensed, which he called the invisible love of creation. And that he said that creation radiates love. So as a young boy, he was impulsed by the storage banks of the universe. And he felt that he knew the purpose of his life then. He was filled with wisdom, and he felt he was filled with memories. And he heard his own voice start to speak. He said, my life is made out of the love of creation. And he also heard his voice say, since ancient times, I lived among the stars. And he felt this unfamiliar longing for what he called the vast distances and the faraway worlds. So Billy is a very, very ancient spirit form. And according to Meyer information, he's reincarnated here on the earth as Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. And he's taught this teaching called the teaching of the Spirit in each one of these lifetimes. Now, one of the most important aspects of the teaching of the Spirit is learning how to control our thoughts. And that's what this book, Macht der Gedanken, is all about. Because 
we here on the earth are a people that are ill in our consciousness. And Elizabeth Moosberger wrote this introduction which says, So the book which lies before you is dedicated to a humankind that is ill in its consciousness. So it finds again the creational natural way which it lost long ago. So what is ill about our consciousness? Sloth told Billy, Sloth was Billy's first contact, Sloth told Billy the biggest problem with the earth human is they no longer understand what the creation is, what the universal consciousness is. And the universal consciousness operates in a creational natural way by certain creational natural laws. And the fundamental creational natural law is called love. Now, not the love of romance, but a different kind of love. A love that's based on wisdom. A love that's based on understanding that we're all connected all connected in amazing ways. And I think that love also has the ability to appreciate things. The ability to, for example, appreciate the the beauty of nature. So, there is a purely thought-feeling-based or emotional love that that is created by human beings. However, that is not the all-embracing and all-calming creational love that I'm talking about. And notice I said all-calming because there's something about true love, love, wisdom-conditioned love, that has a calming effect. Now, it's very interesting. In the book, The Might of the Thoughts, Billy talks about that, that love... Romantic love is like having, you know, someone embrace you with their wings, but they have a sword underneath those wings, and and you're going to get stabbed by that sword eventually. Now, this is not what we mean by wisdom-conditioned love. Wisdom-conditioned love comes from observation. It comes from observation, objective observation of some subject. And wisdom conditioned love comes also when we achieve a certain self-control. And part of learning to control our thinking is learning self-control. And the Meyer information explains that we are living in a time that's called the third millennium. And it's a time when confusion and maliciousness will spread over the earth. And people will become dumbed down. And they will become indolent and obtuse. And they won't understand what's going on in the world around them. And part of the reason that people don't understand what's going on anymore. It's because they've lost the ability to think independently. And that's one of the skills in the spiritual teachings, is learning to think independently. Because it's really coming to know truth in your own thoughts and in your own mind that it is important. However, most people go along with the herd. And that's where we're at now. And because, we see, we live in what's called a consciousness condition tyranny today. A tyranny to control your mind so you do not understand and appreciate the power of your own thinking and the power of your own ability. So let me play a clip on the importance of being an independent thinker. What you do is because you follow what society does. How much of what you do is based on your own independent thinking to say, wait a second, maybe that's not how it's supposed to be. Maybe society has it backwards because there's an explanation to that in terms of that being easier, less righteous, more fun, more enjoyable, 
because they're constrained by fears, because they live in a world of limitations. Because I promise you, when you think on your own and you have independent thoughts, and you realize that, like Ashton Kutcher said, that the world was made up of people that are really no smarter than you. So who dictates where that goes? But the bottom line is most people like to follow, not lead. Most people don't want to live in their thoughts of thinking by themselves. Okay, so that's, that's very important. We need to learn to control our thinking. Our thoughts are very, very important. And there's very, very much going on today that's competing for our thoughts and for our attentions. Uh, what we need to learn to do is stay focused in our thinking, stay neutral positive, and to not be overwhelmed by the circumstances that are coming. Because there are some very incredible, shocking things that are predicted to be coming our way here on the earth. Um, the thing is this, we've been penetrated, we've been infiltrated. How high up it goes is anyone's guess. We know that the president's middle name is not Jesus. We know that the military has been told to stand down. We know the police have been told to stand down. We know that there's only one sacred religion in the United States of America, and it isn't the founding religion. It's the invasive religion. And the fact of the matter is, the FBI director who warned us Six weeks ago, this was just before Hussein's uh, conference, anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism conference in Washington, where he invited Muslim groups. <clears throat> he disinvited the head of the FBI who said that ISIS is in 49 out of the 50 states. And why would he do that to the head of the FBI who warned us? There's only one answer. Someone in that team in the White House is playing for the other side. They're not on our side. Now, of course, the good news here, Alex, is when I saw this terrible event last night, the good news is the beefy Texas cops killed the scum. They, they wiped the scum off the planet and sent them to heaven where they can go rape. Go rape. So what's going on here? What am I talking about? Well, let me read a little section here from the book called The Goblet of Truth, which talks about something called the Dark Order. However, all the items named here only represent the start because in secret there is a mighty organization of the governing class and mightful ones as well as many of their obedient lackeys emerging from amongst your humanity who are creating a secret order of darkness with their own evil laws and ordinances who are bent on hatred for the poor and weak and against the economically imprisoned and all normal citizens. And it is their desire to seize ever more might, more money, and entire mastery over the whole earth and your humanity for themselves. Therefore, it is spreading their evil supremacy all over the world, supported by its obedient vassals of all kinds who are greedy for blood as well as profit. So we live in a very strange time, and one of the things I think that is 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 going to happen real soon here, July 15th, is the beginning of this military exercise here in the United States called Jade Helm. And I think we're being conditioned. The Meyer information explains that here in the United States, we could have two civil wars, and that eventually our great nation could be divided into five different areas. And it also says that in the North American continent will be the greatest disaster in human history when biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons are released by automated systems which run outside of human control. So there are very, very shocking prophecies and predictions that are talked about in the Meyer information. Now, one of the interesting things that I've learned here is why we're given prophecies and predictions. Well, one of the reasons is this, because here on the earth, as I was saying earlier, we don't know how to think independently anymore. 
And we can't be told things directly. So we're given things, sometimes in prophecies and predictions, so that we will think independently. Because prophecies and predictions require us, in many ways, to think independently. See, we've been conditioned by this tyranny to go along with things and to not be independent thinkers. But it's very, very important for us to learn to think independently. Let me read something that Askett said. Askett was Billy's second contact. Billy had 11 years of contact with an extraterrestrial man named Spoth, 11 years of contact with an extraterrestrial woman named Askett. Askett said, The human is still not capable of coping with and fully understanding the truth. And he is not yet mature enough to know his future and to approach it correctly. For that reason, the truth must be rewritten prophetically for him as in equations in order to make him think independently, whereby he slowly finds and recognizes the truth himself. So that's that's what it means to... Um, to think independently. And it's very important that we learn to think independently. I have some of the some of the prophetic stuff um that the Meyer information has talked about queued up here on a on another clip. Here we go. Meyer is a uh sixty year old man living in Switzerland. Meyer has one arm, he lost his arm in about nineteen sixty. He started to take photographs of UFOs in 1964. He claims that his first contacts with extraterrestrials took place when he was only a five-year-old boy. That there is more photographic evidence and, and, and video evidence for this particular case than any other existing case. And it's, it's, it's almost so good that you're just like, holy cow. When he took a lot of this, this material, took these photos, there was no Photoshop. There were no home computers. If these had been hoaxes, his designs for these craft are quite interesting. These official contacts with extraterrestrials taking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs and films and everything else that followed, the skeptics would like us to believe that this man with no resources, working as a night watchman and on a partial disability pension with one hand, is not only a master model maker, Filmmaker, photographer, digital and special effects person, videographer, metallurgist, electronics genius, sound recording engineer, knowledgeable about topography and map making, geography, ancient history, uh, mining, ores, agriculture, and 30 other disciplines that he's brought to bear in terms of the information in this case. They will credit him with that, but they won't say, hey, the guy's telling the truth. He's the one that's meeting with people. In 1958, Meyer sent to the 25 European countries is about 115, 120 specific predictions. The United States of America will be engaged in two wars with Iraq. The second war will be conducted under a president who is the son of a former president. The second war will lead to an unbelievable disaster. The end game is this, and this has been said even before we launched the war in Iraq pertaining to U.S. military policies. Unless the United States withdraws from all military bases and from all wars, stops sticking its nose in everybody else's business around the world, there will be a third world war, which will eliminate three quarters of the population of the planet. It will devastate the North American continent. We will be among the hardest hit. All of our major cities will be destroyed. We are in for a bad time. And I said, Billy, I remember reading in the prophecies that Russia is said it's a high likelihood Russia will invade Iran as well as Turkey and then go into Scandinavia and this and that. This is all stuff allegedly published thousands of years ago before we even knew about Russia. So what Michael Horn is talking about there are the Hennick prophecies, and that's what I was discussing earlier. So you're going to need these thinking skills. You're going to learn to think independently. You're going to learn to control your thoughts. You're going to have to learn to use deductive reasoning. 
as opposed to belief. Deductive reasoning says if A, then B. If Mark, if all men are mortal and Mark is a man, then Mark is mortal. Now, logic has been de-emphasized to the people of Earth for for intentional reasons. Even even some of our um, religious writings have de-emphasized logic. Let me let me read something here that will explain this. This was apparently because followers of the new religion were supposed to obey the teachings of the church and its priests and scribes rather than to think independently. And if one uses logic, one is thinking independently for oneself. Our thoughts are very important. Our thoughts lead to the circumstances in our life. You need to look at your consciousness like a garden. If your consciousness is not correctly maintained, there will be wildly growing negative thoughts in your garden. And these can really take control of your life. So you need to consciously purge those thoughts. Every time you have one of those thoughts, stop. Think of something else. These these thoughts are a lot like weeds growing in your garden. These negative repeating thoughts are very destructive. Now, the Meyer information explains that as long as you think yourself to be helpless, you will be helpless. And you will be affected by external circumstances. But we are actually the Lord and Masters of our own life. And it takes self self cognition to understand that. What you think you can make real. You need to nurture good and positive thoughts. And you should have a good opinion of yourself. Nurture means to support, to encourage, you can mean to train, to feed, to educate. You need to cherish those thoughts. You need to clarify your thoughts. That sometimes ca- comes from repeating repeating good, neutral, positive thoughts. If a person is a criminal, if they're a miser, they've thought those thoughts for a long time. And negative repeating thoughts can take over your life. And that's what happens to the addict. Addiction is a chronic brain disease that causes compulsive substances use, despite the harmful consequences. There is a reward pathway in the brain called the mesolimbic dopamine system. And you can become addicted to natural rewards, such as food, social interaction, uh, alcohol drugs, sex, all sorts of things you can become addicted to. And you can have runaway thoughts. One of the problems that people don't understand, I didn't understand, is that we have unconscious thoughts. Thoughts we're not even aware of. The unconscious is the part of the mind that is inaccessible to the conscious mind. It affects our behavior. It affects our emotions. Certain things occur in the unconscious mind automatically. And they're not available to introspection. They just occur. So we have to be careful. Thoughts can be erupting out of the unconscious. Usually feelings come from thoughts. And they form much slower. Emotions can also erupt out of control. On page 44 of the Maya Thoughts, it says, And furthermore, it is a fact that while the human being wants the good and the positive in their life, we actually prevent the achievement of the good and positive because we don't steer our thoughts correctly. And sometimes we maintain wishes and hopes that are not good for us. But our thoughts can be controlled and maintained along the right path 
if we have self-control. Billy talks about self-control. Self-control is gained through self-scrutiny, where you're looking at your thoughts, trying to keep them under control. This is sometimes an effort that takes great exertion. Sometimes it can be difficult. It can be arduous. If you don't control your thoughts, they can run out of control in a, re- in a loop, in a negative, repeating, reoccurring loop. And that's the reason that psychically disturbed human beings always see black. And they always see, see, see things negatively. That's because their perceptive ability becomes very limited and very narrow. Uh, by these negative repeating thoughts. So we have to make sure that we don't fall into the problem of negative repeating thoughts. We need to learn to control our thoughts. We need to become great thinkers, like some of the thinkers of the past. One of the great thinkers of the past was Plato. And let's listen to this clip that tells us a little about Plato. The Greek philosopher Plato was a student of Socrates and teacher of Aristotle. He wrote on a wide variety of topics, including politics, aesthetics, cosmology, and epistemology. To this day, we refer to Platonic love and Platonic ideals. Plato's search for knowledge and truth formed the basis of much of Western philosophy. Plato's birth date is disputed. Some sources say around 428 B.C., others claim 424 B.C. In any case, it was a fortunate birth. Plato's parents were both descended from Athenian nobility. Like other children from distinguished families in Athens, Plato received the best education of the day, studying philosophy, poetry, and gymnastics. Plato grew up during the Peloponnesian War and as a young man saw the political chaos surrounding the final defeat of Athens by Sparta. Two of Plato's relatives came to power in the new government, who were known as the 30 Tyrants, and were notorious for denying Athenians their rights. A couple of their clip again in a minute. I want to talk a little bit more about Plato and thinking. Plato said, think carefully and logically about how to lead your life. Don't let your emotions drag you along. Know yourself. He also said, decode the message of beauty. He said that beautiful things whisper truths about the good life. Remember when I said the incredible splendor of nature is a visible expression of the love of creation and that creation radiates love? Well, Plato said it this way. He said, beautiful things whisper truths about the good life. Plato also warned us that the Athenian society was very focused on the rich and on the sports celebrities. And he said that bad heroes give glamour to flaws in character. Boy, that is so true. Now, I talked earlier about reincarnation and the fact that our spirit form goes through many, many hundreds of millions of lifetimes. Well, these extraterrestrial humans that Billy supposedly has had contact with talk about Plato. And they say that Plato reincarnated in 1892 as a man named Otto Heinrich Muck. And he was born in Vienna. He graduated as an engineer in the Munich College of Advanced Technology. He eventually ended up in the Penamunde rocket research team, which was where all the rocket scientists in German, Germany were working during World War II. Otto Muck had 2,000 inventions by the time of his death. So that, that was another lifetime of this spirit form, Plato. So each time you incarnate, you're a new person. This very ancient spirit form of Plato incarnated about the 4th century B.C. And there was probably another lifetime in between these 
two lifetimes of Plato and Otto Muck. But the importance of our thinking is very, very important, especially today with all the difficulties that are coming in in this world right now. If these my prophecies come true, and I hope they don't. One of the things we have to watch out for is unsatisfaction. You need to be satisfied. Unsatisfaction kills off all initiative for striving towards that which is higher. And it lets the human being sink into kind of a brooding misery and inactivity. You'll start to feel oversaturated. If you're thinking thoughts that are not neutral positive, you'll feel oversaturated. You'll feel burdened. You'll feel burdens in some way. Wrong thinking leads to oversaturation. If you feel oversaturated, typically you also suddenly have an absence of creativity, a lack of ideas, a lack of initiative. That could be because your thoughts have turned sour. They've turned a little bit towards negative. Get your thoughts back to balanced, just slightly towards the positive. Essentially, unsatisfaction can kill motivation. It kills striving. We start to feel oversaturated. Oversaturation, to define the term oversaturation, uh, one of the best examples would be when you've heard a sitcom, you've watched the sitcom too many times, or you've heard a a song on the radio too many times. It's oversaturation. In fact, I think the the global elite to dark secret order intentionally oversaturates us with certain things. So it leads to this absence of creativity. It keeps us from thinking independently. It destroys our initiative. Unsatisfaction is inevitably connected with a profound absence of creativity and a lack of initiative. Yes, the dark order is attacking the might of our thoughts. One of the ways they attack the might of our thoughts is through hypnosis. And the television hip- hypnotizes us. YouTube, certain YouTubes can hypnotize us. Certain religion leads to hypnosis. Uh, certain too much dependent, dependence on belief puts you in a hypnotic state where you're very open to suggestion. You need not to be submissive. You need to think independently and control your thoughts. All great thinkers in the past, whether it's Plato or Otto Muck or Socrates, could think independently. Let's pick back up with our The group ruled briefly until this despised oligarchy was overthrown and Athens returned to democracy in 403 BC. You might expect, given Plato's prominent family connections, that he was destined to be a politician. Plato's life took a different path, however, when he met the great teacher Socrates and was inspired by his philosophy of the pursuit of knowledge and virtue. It's ironic considering that Socrates was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens, including Plato. Socrates was unpopular with the 30 tyrants as well as with the leaders of the newly restored democracy. In a grave miscarriage of justice, Socrates was found guilty of the trumped-up offenses and was sentenced to death. Plato tried to prevent his execution, offering to pay a fine to spare Socrates' life. However, Socrates willingly went to his death. Plato was forever afterwards disgusted by politics and dedicated his life to the study of philosophy, like his teacher. Although Plato was famously taught by Socrates, he was also influenced by Pythagoras and others. After Socrates' death, Plato left Athens and traveled for a dozen years studying various subjects, including mathematics with the Pythagoreans in Italy and geometry and astronomy in Egypt. During these travels, Plato wrote his early dialogues, which featured Socrates and his teachings. Since Socrates did not write any books of his own, these dialogues represent one of the very few pictures of the legendary philosopher and his style of discourse. Returning to Athens, Plato founded the Academy around 387 B.C., The Academy is thought to be the first Western institution of higher learning. 
Here, one could attend open-air lectures in astronomy, biology, mathematics, politics, and philosophy. The Socratic method was commonly used as a form of... So we need to be independent thinkers. We need to be not not be submissive. We need to use deductive reasoning. We need to constantly steer our thoughts to the neutral positive. We we must not be submissive. If if we're submissive, it doesn't allow our inner nature to grow. Submissiveness it stunts the evolution of the consciousness. And we have to watch out for these gloomy thoughts that can come in. Uh, in fact, those gloomy thoughts can tend us to put us into that negative uh negative thought process. We need to guide our thoughts away from what the Meyer information calls gloomy illusionary pictures. And we need to control our thoughts and our feelings so that they can be neutral positive in nature. Our thoughts, if we allow wishes and if we allow those thoughts to be nurtured, we can have informed consciousness pictures which can bring enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, if we use our enthusiasm and put forth effort, then we can affect reality. So the the ability to harness your thoughts and to focus your thoughts is the key to being successful. Use deductive reasoning. Avoid unsatisfaction. Unsatisfaction can lead to a lack of initiative. It can lead to oversaturation. Keep your thoughts neutral positive, and you'll have enthusiasm, your spirits will stay up. If you are if you have wrong thinking, you'll have oversaturation, the absence of creativity, a lack of ideas, and a lack of initiative. So that's the way to kind of evaluate your own thinking. It's an incredible skill. It's very, very important, particularly in the time that we live. Um, we're, we're living in a time when our leaders are becoming uh, megalomaniacs. They are taking away our rights of self-determination. And this taking away of our rights of self-determination, you'd think that people would stand up, but they're becoming indolent, they're becoming obtuse, and they're becoming indifferent. And they're losing their ability to think independently. And that's people develop the herd mentality. It's almost like uh, being hypnotized. And I want to give you an example of of there are there's hip, hypnosis that's being used on us today. And I want to give an example uh, an example I often bring up of of a particular television television evangelist. Let me let me pick up. Oh, yeah. But when it comes to opulence, few religious leaders compare to Kenneth Copeland. Amen. To show you his house, we rented his helicopter so you can see his 18,000-square-foot mansion valued at over $6 million. He lives in this home outside Fort Worth, Texas. It has beautiful water views and comes complete with a boathouse. But that's not all. Copeland is an avid pilot, and here's his pride and joy, a $20 million Cessna Citation jet. It's the fastest private jet money can buy. He said he needed it to better serve the Lord, and proudly did a flyby for his followers after the church bought it. 
But it's not just one plane. We found a fleet of planes registered to the church. And you won't catch him waiting in line at the airport because he's got his own. The Kenneth Copeland Airport located right next to his mansion. I think Copeland is unbelievably greedy. Amen. She sent them a lot of money, uh, a whole lot of money. When Christy Parker's mother died of cancer, she found diaries that showed her mother sent Copeland most of her life savings. Okay, the Meyer information explains that we currently are living in a consciousness condition tyranny, uh, a tyranny that came out of the tyranny of the revived Roman Empire, or the Roman Empire. And it's a tyranny that's really focused on controlling our thoughts more than anything. Um, it's And it's manifested in various ways. Uh, in ancient times, if you go back all the way to Egypt, the, there were there was a group called the Giza Intelligences, and these were extraterrestrial humans who used religion to control the people of the earth. And the first one of these uh, quote unquote kings of wisdom was was a man named Eris the Eleventh, and he was uh, eleven. Uh, generations back from a man named Eris the Barbarian who was here during uh, the times of Atlantis and Lemuria. If you go back 133,000 years ago or so, Eris the Barbarian came after several thousand years after it, both Atlantis and Mu had been established. And the two great cities were were living in prosperity and peace. And then Eris the Barbarian came here. He conquered the northern area, which we call Hyperborea today. Hyperborea was in the North Pole, and it, incredible, it had like summer all year round. It was a really incredible place. Now, Eris the Barbarian conquered Hyperborea. His son, Eris the Second, conquered the area today that we call India and Pakistan. Eventually, Eris and his followers stirred up the Great War, which pretty much wiped out almost all life on Earth about 11,500 years ago. In other words, if we don't learn from history, we're going to repeat these same mistakes that have occurred in the ancient past. You see, there have been two other civilizations at least on this earth that destroyed themselves. The civilization before us was Atlantis and Lemuria. There was a, a civilization that also destroyed itself before Atlantis and Lemuria. This civilization was headed up by one of these Ishwish kings of wisdom called Pelagon. And Pelagon brought about 70,000 people with him here to the earth. And he set up a, a civilization. Pelagon was a very benevolent leader. And the people of the native earth humans, who they called Evas at that, that time, some dark-skinned people that were living on the earth, had great respect for him. And he had great respect for them. He never abused the native earth humans. And he was a... Um, a leader who was beneficent. He was. Um, he had great wisdom and kindness, and his civilization lasted for thousands of years. Eventually, when he died, the negative historical trends took over in Pelagon civilization, and it destroyed itself in a great Third World War. You know, the Earth was dormant for about seven thousand years. And then people came here from other star systems again. Uh, Atlantis, uh, Atlant, who was the leader of Atlantis, came here with his wife, Caratide, and about 70,000 other folks. And they set up Atlantis on the island continent. And then um, uh, the, the leader of Lemuria came and set up the, the city of 
Agartha Alpha and Agartha Beta and uh, Mu. Uh, Agartha Alpha and, and Agartha Beta were underground cities. They were connected by tunnels, and we and, and the city of Mu was was above that. And anyway, these two great nations existed here on the earth in the, in the ancient past, and they destroyed themselves again. Why did they destroy themselves? Well, they lost control of their thinking. And because thoughts lead to actions, thoughts lead to the circumstances of your life. Have you ever seen a mob get out of control when they lose control of their own thinking? Well, that's what happens. That's how these negative historical trends, they start. When we as a society learn learn to we lose the ability to control our thoughts. We need to keep our thoughts neutral, positive. If we have neutral, positive thoughts, we'll have neutral, positive feelings, which will lead to good habits and good circumstances in our life. You'll have initiative. You'll have enthusiasm. You'll have optimism. And all these things will make you more productive at whatever you do in life. So anyway, that's been our show for this afternoon on Makder Gedanken, the might of the thoughts. We looked a little bit about what has happened historically when societies lose control of their thinking and their thinking falls into degeneracy. That can lead to lead to the destruction of entire society. And I'll let you decide whether our society is on the right path or not. I'll be back this evening at 8 p.m. Eastern on uh, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com for more Ohio exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder, and we'll talk to you again later. Have a good afternoon. Mm-hmm.